Okay, good morning once again. Um, if you can turn in your Bibles to Revelation 21, and the only other place you're going to turn to today is Ephesians chapter 1, so if you stick one finger in Ephesians chapter 1, otherwise the rest of the verses will be on the screen, or I'll just give the references or so on. But this time of year is that time of year where you don't know if you want to turn on your heat, or if you don't want to know when you, if you turn on your air conditioner, because things change. Now next week will probably be up in the 80s. But I see all of you coming in today pretty much, you know, with sweaters or long sleeves and so on. But I still wear my short sleeves, so I guess. But anyways, I came from northern Michigan, so I'm used to this kind of weather. This is, to me, this is pretty mild and nice here. But um, we're all different. Okay, so in your bulletin, you also have a sheet of verses on here. That'll make it simpler for you. These are some of the verses we're going to go through. And I'll explain to you as we go through this. So as we continue in our study of the book of Revelation, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 21, verse 7 today. But before I read that verse, I'm going to title this, How to Be an Overcomer. Now, we're going to look at overcomer, inheritance, salvation, these three topics, these three terms today. This is going to be an educational message, okay? So if you want to take notes, this is a good time to take notes, notes because this is something that you're going to want to remember and you're going to want to refer to because this is some cool stuff that we're going to go through today and not everybody understands this stuff. A lot of churches you'll never get taught this idea about rewards, inheritance, uh, being an overcomer at all. You really won't. But I think it's a clear teaching in the Bible and this is pretty exciting. So let's go ahead and get into this here. First I want to say salvation is through faith in Christ. The split second you trust Christ as Savior, you're saved for all eternity. All eternity. It's not temporary probation. Temporary probation, you're saved until you screw up, right? That'd be bad because I'd be, I'd be, I'd screw it up all the time. I, I wouldn't make it. I'm thankful that it is Christ and that eternal life means eternal life when I place my faith in Christ. He paid for all my sins on the cross of Calvary. The two beautiful verses, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, John 3, 16, if you understand, take them verses for what they, you, they say, it makes it simple for you, doesn't it? And that's, that's what's cool about this. So uh, what I'm saying adamantly is our church, our doctrinal statement, tells us that it's impossible to lose your salvation. Now some people you say, once saved, always saved, look at you in horror. Like you actually believe that? Or you can go out and live as you please? Well, we're going to talk about that today. But once you're saved, you are sealed in Jesus Christ. He saved you for all eternity because it's all Him, it's not you. You don't deserve it when you, before you are saved, you don't deserve it after you are saved, do you? It's all by grace of Christ. So that's salvation. Now inheritance. We're going to talk about inheritance, and there's actually two parts to inheritance, which kind of coincides with two parts for overcomers. So inheritance, to receive an inheritance because you are an heir. Every person that trusts Christ as Savior, every believer is an heir. You will inherit the earth. You will inherit heaven. You will inherit eternal life. That's all I give me for every single Christian, okay? Get that straight because we're going to go over this a few times. But then the second part is a child of God could also have a greater inheritance because you're willing to suffer for Christ. You can have a greater inheritance if you really dedicate yourself to Christ. And I'll explain this and we'll understand it. That's, isn't that good news? Not only do you get to go to heaven, but he's going to give you something more if you're willing to dedicate and serve your life right now and suffer for him. Do you, do you know of any churches where they actually tell you that, hey, to suffer for Christ is to your benefit because you'll be rewarded for that? I don't think people talk. Joel Olstein don't talk about this, does he? Okay. Uh, Stephen Fairdick don't talk, doesn't talk about this. And plenty of these other prosperity preachers does, do not talk about you suffering for Christ that it, you will be blessed abundantly. But I'm telling you, you will. Now, an overcomer. An overcomer is that Greek word. It's in Revelation 27. It's used many other verses. It's the Greek word nikao. Nikao. We get an English word from that. And actually, it's a shoe company. It Englishize it. It's Nike, okay? Nike shoes. It means victorious. It means overcomer. Nikao in the Greek. Um, the present participle of that word and I don't mean to get too deep into Greek, but it means right now you are earning an added inheritance, inheritance if by your victorious life over self, over sin, also your willingness to stand for Christ in all instances of persecution and suffering, you right now are earning a greater inheritance. You're earning rewards, okay, in heaven. That is something for you and I to be excited about. 
There is a reason for re living for Christ, right? There really is. You know, we don't believe in works for salvation, but we do believe in works after salvation. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, you know, says that we should serve and work for him. Not to keep ourselves saved, not to be saved, but because we are saved, we should. And not every Christian does that. Some Christians live as they please, and they think, I have the freedom to do that. So we'll talk about that also here in just a second. But let's go ahead and look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Let me read this. Now, we're going through Revelation 21 and 22 pretty slow. Next week I may just cover one verse also, but after that we're going to speed up a little. I'll cover a couple, lot more verses the week after next, okay? So we'll cover, I think, maybe 10 verses or so. I'm not sure yet, but we'll get through this pretty soon. But this is some good stuff. So Revelation 21, verse 7 says this, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Do you see that? He that overcometh will inherit all things. So, if you notice on the screen, I've got a sword and a Bible. We're going to have a little bit of a sword drill today. That doesn't mean I'm going to call on you to look up verses or anything, but we're going to go through quite a few verses. But these are very important to understand this. This, is, this really is truly cool. Okay? So that he that overcomes shall inherit all things. It means that there's more than one thing. There must be multiple things because this is all things. I mean, if you just inherit heaven, he that overcomes will inherit heaven. If you trust Christ as Savior, you'll go to heaven. But it says all things. It's more than that. So on your paper, if you look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, it says, be not slothful. Now, nobody likes to be called slothful. Let me be, don't be lazy. Be followers of them who through faith and inherit... Faith and patience inherit the promises. Here's what I want you to understand. That word promises is a noun. It is plural. So there's more than one promises that you're going to inherit. And basically, every, every believer inherits heaven if you trust that Christ is Savior. But there's oh so much more. And so that's why he says, be not slothful. Don't, let's not be lazy Christians. You'll get to heaven and you'll be there. But... Follows of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You can inherit promises. So remember that verse, Hebrews 6, 12. That ties right in with Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. So I've got on here, um, I will be his God and he shall be my son. Um, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 is also on your paper. All right, Galatians 3, 26 and Galatians 3, 28. 3, 26 says, you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Every single one of us, if you've placed your faith in Christ Jesus, you are a child of God. Isn't that amazing? We never, none of us on this earth, we love our parents dearly, but our parents weren't perfect, are they? And I'm, as a parent, I wasn't perfect either, far from it. I, sometimes, don't you say, I would like to go back and be a parent and do this all over again. Well, I'm not so sure we'd want to do that. We'd probably still make the screw-ups and mistakes we've made. But anyways... Um, you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You're going to have a perfect father in heaven. And you're his child, child. Verse 28 of Galatians chapter 3. Neither is there Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In heaven, the distinctions that we have right now, there will not be that in heaven. Okay, right? We have distinctions. We, you know, different, different, uh, way, you know, where we're from different ethnic groups, different uh, salaries, rich, poor, bond, free, male, female, all that. You won't have that distinction in heaven. But there will be a distinction in heaven, especially in um, the millennial kingdom, and that is there will be those that will be close to Christ, serving with him and be rewarded, whereas others won't be because they haven't served him on this life right now. So I'm telling you, it's important for you to serve him. So we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But he that overcomes, it says, and he shall be my son. We're in Christ Jesus. We will be the son of God the Father. Isn't that kind of cool when you think about that? As we just read there in Galatians 3, 26 and 28. So here, what we first want to understand is we're going to go through these three terms. So make sure you really understand these by the time we're done. We're going to talk about salvation, which I beat at salvation to you every single week because I think it's extremely important for to understand that. But we're going to talk about being an overcomer and inheritance. So these three terms, by the time we leave here, you're really going to want to know and understand this. So first of all is salvation. We know 
that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1a, then 4 and 5, let me read this. Whosoever believes, whosoever what? Whosoever believes, thank you, that Jesus Christ is born of God. He's the Messiah. That's what Christ means. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the Savior. Born of God. You were lost. Now you're saved. You're born of God. For, then it goes on, for whosoever, anyone can believe. Why would it say whosoever if God just chooses certain ones? Don't get that screwed up with election and all. We're going to talk about that too. Anybody in this world that is born into this world can be saved by simple faith in Christ. That's why it says whosoever. That's why God says that. Does it make sense to you? If I said whoever wants to go to Pizza Hut after church today can go with me to Pizza Hut and I'm buying. You would think you'd understand that as every single person, right? Now if I'd say I want no one to take you, you, and you, and you, and the rest of you can't go to Pizza Hut, you'd understand that too, wouldn't you? But I'm, if I say whosoever, you understand whosoever, right? I mean, God wrote this Bible so it's simple to understand. So anyone can believe. For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, the Nick K.O., that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. As I said, Nick K.O. means victorious. A believer overcomes the world. So first and foremost, if you trust trusted Christ as Savior, that sin problem that you had was taken care of. God sees you now through his Son. You're in Christ and you have everlasting life. You inherit eternal life. You inherit heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that the best news in all the world? And that's why I want to keep this as clear and as simple as we can. So I want you to dogmatically know beyond all doubts that every Christian is first and foremost an overcomer. It's all based on have you believed in Jesus Christ? If you trust him as your Savior, you are saved for all eternity. You are an overcomer. But there's more to this overcomer than that, okay? An overcomer, the, pr primarily, you have everlasting life, you'll be in heaven. But there's more to it, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. So let's talk about an overcomer. We'll continue, we'll dig into this a little deeper. So now let's mention and discuss overcomer a little bit. We looked at 1 John 5, uh, verse 4 and 5, be just previous to this, but as just discussed, let me read this again. 1 John chapter 5, verse 5. Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes Jesus is the Son of God? Isn't that simple? How do you overcome the world? You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came, God sent him, he died for your sins, paid for all your sins. You are an overcomer, okay? So here's, I want you to know this. Capital K, capital N, capital O, capital W. I want you to know this. Every believer is saved for all eternity, Therefore, positionally, you're an overcomer. Don't you feel good? Don't you feel like going, yes, I'm an overcomer, right? Doesn't it get you excited? You are an overcomer. But let's go ahead and look at this. Your future home in heaven is with a 100% assurance. You cannot now go to hell if you tried. You're in Christ, right? You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You can't. You stop believing. Too bad. He's faithful. He's going to keep you. It doesn't matter. You can't lose your salvation if you've trusted Christ because you have it forever. So let's look at Ephesians 1, 4 on the screen. Now I'm going to look at some other verses here that we'll turn to a little later in Ephesians chapter 1. But on the screen I've got Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. We want to understand this verse. And it says this. Now Ephesians was written to Christians by the Apostle Paul. It says, according as he has chosen us in him. Don't mess that. He didn't choose you to be in him. He chose you in him before the foundation of the world. He chose you before the foundation. He chose in him before the foundation in Christ. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God has always wanted to have children like he did in paradise in, in, in a, the Garden of Eden to be the people that he could fellowship with and love and show his love to for all eternity. In Ephesians 2, I can't remember the verse, maybe it's 2, 7, says that he wants to show his kindness to us for all eternity. He's always wanted that. And yet we kind of tend to screw that up, don't we? But Adam and Eve chose to sin, didn't they? God knew that's going to happen. He created Adam and Eve before they were even created. He chose us in him, in Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world. He knew he was going to have to send a Savior. Um, Adam and Eve somehow knew that God was going to send a Savior after what happened with them. But God knew they would, and so he had a plan. And his plan was to send a future Savior, Jesus Christ. Adam understood, not Adam, but even Abraham understood this, right? He says, 
um, that he had faith in God. You know, Abraham understood that by faith you'd be saved. And all through the ages they understood it. And then finally that Savior came and died on the cross in 33 AD, right, for our sins and paid for it. We were, they looked forward to it. We look back that it happened in the past. We have all that history we look back at. We had this written Bible. They didn't have that. But it's, we're in such a blessed place here. So as we see here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, this is the record, God's record, God's record. He wrote it, that God has given, given what? It's not earned. It says God has given to us eternal life, not temporary probation. If it was temporary probation, wouldn't it say temporary probation? No, it says eternal life. It does. And this life is where? In his son. Pound that in your head. I want, that's what I want to get across to us. In his son. As Ephesians 1, 4 says, in him, in him, in him. Okay? And this life is in his son. He that has a son has life. He that has not the son has not life. The second you trust Christ as Savior, you're in Christ, right? And additional thing is he, he uh, sealed us with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you an illustration now. Now, I do have some reference on here. I think 2 Peter 1, verse 19 and 20. That's an important one for if you're, going to, if you're taking notes to write that down and look that up. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. But I'm going to give an illustration. This illustration you may look at and say, that's kind of cheesy. Okay, I, I want to make this simple to understand, and maybe it is kind of cheesy, but this is an apt illustration that we can help to understand this idea about in him, election, predestination. It's a simple one. Get this and you truly help you understand. Okay, so here it is. Matthew, do you recognize that? That is Purdue University Airport from the sky. And in fact, if you look by one of these hangars, I think you can see St Matt standing there. <laughs> what? Uh. So anyways, I know my illustration, people could pick this about, but this will get a point across. Pay attention. This simple metaphorical illustration will clear a lot of confusion that has been propagated through Christianity. And every church you go to, they, you'll hear this stuff. Um, there's a French theologian named John Calvin, taught this false teaching 500 years ago, that God chooses that person not that person chooses that person, not that person. Then people go to heaven. That's God's grace. But it's not God's grace for the ones that don't go to heaven. That is an evil, rotten doctrine. It really is because it says, whosoever will may come. And God chose us all. When he died on the cross, he paid for all sins. So this is pretend, okay? This is Purdue, not pretend, but this is Purdue University Airport. Imagine that the Russians and the Chinese are going to nuke Lafayette and West Lafayette, okay? They said, we got something against Lafayette, nuke Lafayette, and West Lafayette. We're going to nuke it. We're going to blow, just blow them off the map. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then a very rich pilot purchases tickets for every person in Lafayette and West Lafayette, offered them free of charge for every one of us, and he's going to fly us to Bemidji Regional Airport up in Bemidji, Minnesota, way up in Minnesota. And every person in Lafayette, West Lafayette can fit in this year. This is some, I know they don't fly 747s out of Purdue Airport. Like, I understand that. And Spirit Airlines. But that fits, doesn't it? We're sealed in Christ, Holy Spirit. Anyways. But, okay. So this plane, 747, will fly you to safety to an airport up in northern Minnesota. All you have to do is believe this captain that paid for your ticket and take the ticket and get on the plane. It's that simple. That plane is predestined to go from Purdue Airport to Bemidji Regional Airport, Bemidji, Minnesota. It's predestined. It's going to go there no matter what. Christ is a pilot. Hebrews 2.10 says Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Did you know that? Hebrews 2.10. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Okay, so here, here's the thing. That plane is predestined from eternity past when God decided before the foundation of the world that he's going to save people by sending his son so you take that free gift of salvation, get on that plane, and you will end up in Bemidji, Minnesota. So now if you've turned to Ephesians chapter 4, we'll look at these verses. Ephesians 1, verse 4. And I'm going to read this to you. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God created us. He wants us to be holy and blameless without love. As Christians, he predestinated us to serve him, to love him. And verse 5, 
It tells us there, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So we're chosen in him. God predestined his son to be our savior and by faith in him, as you see in Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, we by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So here's the thing. God chose his son to come and die on the cross for your sins. And he's going to take you to heaven, but you have to be willing to accept that free gift he offers, um, the free gift of salvation. I trust you, Jesus, because I know I'm a sinner, and I will be put on that plane. Now, when you're on that plane, the captain of your salvation, Hebrews 2.10, Jesus Christ is going to fly that plane. I think you feel pretty, I hate flying. I really do. When I'm on a plane, I'm, I'm like this. I'm, I'm sitting there. I, I have to have a book in front of me, read it. I take my concentration off. I have these headphones that I put on that block out all sound. I, I just hate flying. I just do. And I know there's people like that. They'd rather drive or do something else than fly. But I, don't, I just don't like flying. I've done it so much. And I, I've gone to Mexico over 50 times when I worked at Subaru. And I was always relieved when I got there. And I was re always relieved when I got back. I had some pretty bad flights. I was in storms at times. I was in turbulence at times. There was times we were going to land in, I think it was Dallas, um, Texas. And because of the storm, they circled around. They said, okay, we can't land. We're going to fly over here to, to uh, Florida, land in the, I think it was Miami International Airport possibly. And you're going to sit there in this plane for like two hours. And then when the storm clears up, we'll fly back to Texas, okay? And I'm sitting there thinking, get me off of this plane. And so I don't like flying at all. But anyways, notice here, chosen in him, God predestined his son to be our savior. And by being in him, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And he will, wouldn't you try, if Jesus is flying this plane, you'd feel safe, wouldn't you? Pretty much. Now there may be turbulences, right? What Christian doesn't go through turbulences? We all do. We don't like it. We suffer. We have things that we go through. It's not good. First John 5, 11 says, and this is the record that God has given us eternal life this life is in his son okay everyone can get on that plane the captain of our salvation paid for salvation for everybody we all can be redeemed so i know that may be a goofy illustration but doesn't that help clear things make things a little more sense okay so let's go ahead and go to the next one which is we're going to talk about this inheritance so we talked about salvation so let's work these two aspects of inheritance with the free gift of salvation. Okay, as I said, there's an there's inheritance um, one and two, let's call them right now. We'll get clear this up in a little second. But Matthew 5.5 5 says, Jesus said this, blessed are the meek. The meek are the humble, aren't they? Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. So it, if a humble person, blessed are the meek, they admit they're a sinner. You can't earn your acceptance before God. You can't earn your salvation. Um, you can't do anything within yourself. You humbly have to trust Christ as your Savior. You will inherit the earth, the new heaven, the new earth. You inherit it. You'll be in the millennial kingdom. You'll be in heaven. That is the first aspect of the inheritance. You have that. If you trust Christ as Savior, you have a future home in heaven. And look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, your 401k you can send to heaven. Your 401k on this earth may depreciate. Your car is going to end up in a junkyard someday. Everything we own is going to be gone. But here, an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, reserved, reserved, reserved in heaven for you. Okay, Titus chapter 3 verse 7 on this paper that I give you, it says this, being justified by grace. We're justified by grace, right? Christ paid for our sins, we're justified before him. Justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. According to so we have eternal life, and we'll be heirs of eternal life, but there's more to it than that. We'll, we have more that he offers us, which is wonderful. And in fact, I, there's a verse that I have on the screen. I don't have it written down, but write this verse down, Colossians 3.24. This is another very important verse, Colossians chapter 3, verse 24. Read that verse. It tells you that you're... Your additional inheritance is synonymous with rewards. I think that's cool. So there's more to inheritance than what we think. There's rewards. It, they're kind of one and the same. The additional rewards or inheritance we can get in heaven. That's Colossians 3.24. So now I'm going to look at Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14. 
This is called, the Latins and the people that are real intelligent, they call this the Ordo, ordo Salutus. Anybody ever hear that? Ordo Salutus, it's a Latin term. It means order of salvation is what it means, okay? And so Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, and Dave, I know you covered this um, on Thursday night, but it says, in whom you also trusted. When did you trust him? After that you heard the word of truth. What is the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation. So when did you get saved? You got saved when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after you believed, what happened? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're on Spirit Airlines. You're inside. You're protected. The captain of salvation is going to keep you sealed and safe. Here's the thing. i got you to understand this. Let's finish this, and I'll mention this. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's a promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance. And tell the redemption to buy back. Redemption means buy back of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. A praise, praise of his glory. Jesus Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, they're in heaven waiting for you to get there. The praise of his glory. He can't wait for you. That's how much he loves you. He says, I'm going to come and die for these people. And I'm going to pay for all their sins so that they can come to heaven as sinless beings that can live forever with me. And he looks forward to that time that he could be with us. You don't understand that? Does that bring tears to your eyes? It should. But here, let's talk about this. Earnest of your inheritance. I believe probably most of y'all have bought in a house before. When you buy a house, you give earnest money. You say that, you tell that realtor or that person that sells us, I have faith, I'm going to buy that house and I'm going to give you some money. If you back out or you default, they keep that earnest money, don't they? That's earnest money. Do you realize that God has given the earnest of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit seals us? You know, that... If, if something happens, God backs out, he loses his Holy Spirit, right? You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That ain't going to happen. You're sealed. God gives you an earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchase price. What a beautiful um, doctrine that is, isn't it? We are sealed for all eternity. The Holy Spirit, that's an earnest of our inheritance. God says, okay, I'm going to give these believers all the Holy Spirit. That's my guarantee that I'm going to take them to heaven. He's not going to default, is he? He died on the cross for your sins. He's taken you to heaven. You have a guarantee for sure of going to heaven because he put that money down for you. And now it says, until the redemption of the purchased possession, he's going to pay for the rest of this, which he did on the cross of Calvary, right? That's all paid for. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Free gift of salvation, right? So God put a down payment on each and every one of his children, just like the earnest money you buy in a house, in a sense, guarantee you will be redeemed totally. You're sealed. You will inherit eternal life, the new heaven, the new earth. It's a done deal. It's settled. So now we know that. Let's talk about is there more to an inheritance? Is there something additional you can get? So let's look at this here next. And I want to make this as, as simple and clear as I can understand to be a good teacher, but if you want to go back and restudy this, you can always look at it online. But yes, most definitely, as I told you, Colossians 3.24, the additional inheritance is like a reward. I mean, kind of, they're synonymous, right? So Romans 8, verse 17 and 18. Starting off with verse 8, 17. And if children, then heirs. Didn't we just see that Galatians 3.26, that we're all children by faith in Christ Jesus? So you're a child. And if a child, if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. If your children, then heirs. That word if there is um, the word epsilon iota in Greek. That's E-I in English. And it's pronounced I. Now, if you're from northern Michigan or Canada, you pronounce it A. But it's pronounced I. Okay. If children, then heirs of God. And joint heirs of Christ. If, 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 if. So be, if so be is, is the Greek, it's I pair. It's I pair. It means it's after all. So there's something addition here that and divides it up. And joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Galatians 3.26, we're all children by faith in Christ Jesus. But you know what? You give your life, you dedicate it, you serve with everything you have, you will be a joint heir with Christ. A lot of people don't understand that. You suffer for Christ, you're going to be blessed. You're going to get more yet. Um, you'll be the closest one too. Remember we see Aunt, with Andrew and Peter and John were close to Christ and, and others weren't so much the disciples, but 
in heaven or in the millennial kingdom especially, there's going to be a closeness that we're going to have to Christ versus other people maybe didn't serve him. And that's your benefit for loving and doing everything you can with him. Verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. Not worthy to be compared. Not cannot compare. Not even worthy to try. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Do you see that? So 2 Timothy 2, verse 12 and 13 on your paper, look at that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. What does it say? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, in other words, if we don't suffer with him, he will also deny us. What's he going to deny you? Some people think that means your salvation. Wait, we're sealed in Christ. We're saved for all eternity. He denies you reigning with him. If you're not willing to suffer with Christ, you're not willing to be dedicated for Christ, if you don't serve him, you're not going to be a disciple, he's going to deny you that reigning and living with him in the sense of being a leader in heaven. The rewards that you get. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. But if you stop believing, it says there, if we believe not, um, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself, right? That's what it says there in 2 Timothy. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. He's already sealed you. He's already taken you to heaven. You're his child. You're as good as gold. You're going to be in heaven. But you can get so much more if you're willing to live for him, if you're willing to suffer for him. So we see that there in Romans 8, 17 through 18. We also see that there in 2 Timothy 2, 12 and 13, right? So here's, here's to make this clear this up. Positional overcomer. Upon faith in Christ, you inherit everlasting life. You inherit the earth, an eternal home, i.e. heaven. You're saved for all eternity. Positionally, you're in Christ. You're saved, right? Forever. Practical overcomer is someone upon walking by faith uh, may result in some persecution and suffering. The more you serve Christ, the more you give out tracts, the more you witness to people, the more you live for him at your job or whatever, even with amongst your family, the more likely you're going to be persecuted and you're going to suffer. It's called, I call it turbulence, okay, with my airplane illustration, okay? Romans 8, 18 tells us, um, if so be that we suffer with him, we may also glorify together. Remember that. So a practical overcome, a joint here with Christ. If you're a faithful disciple now, you will inherit so much more. What, now, with many times when a pastor will get up and he'll preach with authority and tell Christians they must live for Christ to receive a greater inheritance, people will murmur and complain and say, that sounds like legalism. You're telling me that I should put Christ first and live with him. You know what? There's, an old, there's a phrase in the army, and it was, be all you can be. Do you remember that, Tamara? Be all you can be? I don't know if they use that phrase anymore. Uh, I didn't get that from Joel Olstein. Um, be all you can be. But you, we can be all that we can be by living for Christ, and he's going to bless us. So people say, well, I want to live as I please. I don't want to do what you're saying. I mean, you, you, you're, you're telling us that we should live for Christ, and we'll get these additional rewards. I'm telling you just what the Bible says. So here, yes, yes, yes. You have the liberty. You have the freedom to live as you please. There's a term for that. It's called antinomianism. What is antinomianism? It means no law. You don't have to follow laws. Uh, you could say, I don't want to follow your standards. I don't want to um, dedicate my service to him. By the way, that's not legalism. You know, legalism is when you say you've got to do certain things to be saved or, or to, you know, for God to be pleased with you and to take you to heaven. That's legalism. Or that the church comes up with these things to say, hey, in our church, you, if you do this way or a certain way, that's legalism when somebody tries to force that on you. But serving Christ, living for Christ, is not legalism. We have the liberty to actually serve him. So look at Galatians 5.13. It tells us there on the screen, for brethren, brethren, save people. Save people are called brethren. Paul says, for brethren, you've been called unto liberty. You've been called unto freedom. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another, right? I mean, yes, we can live for the flesh. We can serve our flesh just like an unsaved person can. But it says they don't do that. But by love, serve one another. How do we serve each other? We give, we share, we care, we encourage each other. We thank each other, we hug each other, we fellowship. We put others first. We listen to people when they talk and we ask questions. We try to put them first. We put God first. So don't use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but I love, serve one another. Put each other first. And I know some of you guys are doing that. I know that. I see it. 
You're doing everything you can to be the person God wants you to be. But I encourage each and every one of us to do that because it is so important. And it goes on here in Hebrews chapter 3. Now Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians, right? In Jerusalem. But that doesn't mean it's not written to us as Christians either. But I was telling the Jewish Christians, you guys, you came out of Judaism, you got saved, and now because of pressure, persecution, you want to drift back into Judaism. Don't do that. I'm warning you, don't do it. So here's Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. Verse 12, take heed. What does that mean, take heed, brethren? Um, there used to be a show called, it was a, before Star Wars. I can't remember what the day of the, something with that little robot uh, warning, warning, warning. Lost in space. What's that? Lost in space. You're right. So, it's, some of you never see. It was you look. You if you were to watch a rerun of that show, you'd say that's pretty cheesy. I mean, compared to what they have today. But it was lost in place. So take heed, brother. And warning, unless there be any of you an evil of heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Hebrews is warning them. Don't go back. A loss of everything. He wants to bless you with. You can lose it. Then it goes on in verse 13, but exhort one another daily. When was the last time you exhorted somebody, one of your brother, brothers and sisters in Christ? Let's do that more. Some of you, I know you send um, text messages out to each other periodically, which is wonderful to encourage each other. We all need that, don't we? We all need encouragement. We all have some times that we go through things. But exhort one another daily. What is called today, unless any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. Christians can go to church, they can become bored, they can want more, go back in the world, and they can. Christians do fall into sin, by the way. I can tell you some pretty awful stories of people that I know 100% were saved, they had a great testimony, they witnessed, they shared the gospel, they understood it, and they fell into sin. And it can happen. So look at verse 14 here of Hebrews chapter 3, and when you look at this, think back to what we just learned in Romans 8, 17 about a joint heir, because look at verse 14. But we are made partakers of Christ. That sounds similar to joint hair with Christ, doesn't it? It really, it's, it's same, same, really. We are made partakers of Christ if, if, if. We hold the beginning of our confidence. What you stand for, what you believe in. Stand firm, be steadfast unto the end. You as a Christian, I want to encourage each and every one of us to encourage you to continue on serving Christ. Don't fall back like the, the Hebrew Christians were warned of. Don't go back into that garbage world. Just keep serving Christ. You'll be a partaker of Christ. As, so Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14 fits right in with Romans 8, 17, doesn't it? Isn't that wonderful? That's pretty cool. So what did Jesus tell the Christians in the seven churches? Remember the seven churches? We, what was it, a couple of weeks ago we went through the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3? Maybe it was a couple of years ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. But anyways... I'm going to go through these here real quick. Now, there's a cool study, if you ever want to do this, Matthew 13, the seven parables in Matthew 13. <coughs> read them and compare them with the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, and someday we'll go through this. But it's kind of cool to see that these seven parables in Matthew 13, how they fit right in with, with uh, Revelation 2 and 3. But anyways, the first one was Ephesus, the, Ephesus, the first church. It was a church that lost their first love. What does he tell them? Reignite your love. There's a promise for an overcomer. You will eat of the tree of life. Now, I can't tell you what that exactly means, but I know that God says you'll eat of the tree of life, and that's going to be something great in heaven. So, reignite your love. Sometimes we kind of go back and we lose our love, right? All these exhortations, these seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, I think are for each and every one of us. I know there's different time periods, but I believe every one of these seven churches exists today, but each church was more, more predominant in a certain age as Ephesus all the way to Laodicea. So that's Ephesus. Reignite your love. Get excited again. Do what you can. Get down on your knees and pray. And Smyrna. Smyrna was a good church, but they went through persecution. They suffered. And he said, fear none of those things which you will suffer, and the promise for an overcomer is you will receive a crown of life. Now, isn't a crown of life a reward? Like it tells us in Revelation 2.10 there, but it also says in James 1.12, it's a reward. You'll receive a crown of life. There's five crowns that you could receive, you know. We studied these on Thursday nights. And so, if you suffer, don't worry about it. You could receive a crown of life. And then, Pergamos. Bad doctrine. They had worse than bad doctrine. The doctrine affected their whole lives, I think. 
but get your doctrine correct. We are very strong here on doctrine. Now, people, a lot of people don't like doctrine. Doctrine just means teaching is all it means. It means two plus two equals two. It just basically means that what the Bible says, what it means, and we can understand it, we should. You need to know your Bibles. So, Pergamos, get your doctrine right. And the promise for an overcomer is you receive the hidden manna and the white stone. Again, what is that going to mean in heaven for us? I don't know for sure. I don't think God wanted to tell us everything. I think it's 1 Corinthians 2 9 says we can't understand everything that's in heaven that we're going to receive. But hey, I think it's going to be pretty good, and I'm not going to say it's not because God promised it to people that overcome. So let's look at church number four. Church number four is Thyatira. Oh, this was a bad church. Uh, stop feeding your flesh. They were fleshly. They were carnal. They had carnal teachers that they were allowing to teach. It was terrible. It was bad. But stop feeding your flesh. Get rid of your carnal teachers. And the promise for the overcomer there is you could be a leader over the nations. We know during the millennial kingdom that Christians are going to be leaders during this time period. We're going to be priests. We're going to be teachers and so on and so on. And so don't feed your flesh. Get rid of that. Then Sardis. Sardis was a dead church. Do you know of any dead churches that you've ever been to? It's like people go to church, they check the box, they go home. The church was dead. But it's like nobody said hi to me, nobody did said anything, nobody. It's like, Bleh. But here, Sardis, your church is dead. Come back to life. Get some life in yourself. Get your blood flowing. And the promise for an overcomer, your name will be confessed before God and angels. Your name will be confessed before God and angels. All of these things, if we do them, it's going to be a beautiful thing for us. Then there's Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a good church, but keep evangelizing. Be patient. Be patient. Probably my greatest weakness. I don't know if it's my greatest weakness. God knows what my greatest weakness is, but I am not a patient person. Ask my wife. I, I wish I was more patient. I try to be, but keep evangelizing. Be patient. And the promise for the overcomer, you'll be a pillar in the temple of God. I think you know what that metaphor means, right? You will be somebody in the. Uh, you'll be somebody in the temple of God, a pillar, not the literal pillar, but you'll be a servant there, a leader in the temple of God. Amazing. And then the last one, Laos, Decia. Laos means people. Decia means rights. Laodicea, which I believe is the last church of the last days, more predominant today, right now, the age that we're living, is the church of people's rights. It reminds me of the book of Judges. I think that's Jason's favorite book, right? <laughs> he doesn't like the book of Judges. He likes Ecclesiastes. But anyways, Judges 21, verse 25. They did which was right in their own eyes. Doesn't that sound like today, with, that was Israel, but doesn't that sound like today, the church of Laodicea, they did what was right in their own eyes? Um, Revelation chapter 3, if you were to read through that, um, uh, the judges, they had no king, nobody, no king. Today, no Jesus. Um, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus is knocking on the door. He wants to come in and have fellows. We don't need you. We're independent. We're wealthy. We have everything. We're the biggest church. Uh, we're independent. We have everything. And he's knocking on the door, and they say, who's there? And they say, Jesus is Jesus. And they say, Jesus who? They don't need him. That's what the church of Laodicea was. He wants to go fellowship with that church, Revelation 3, 20, and that's what that's what it means by knocking on the door. He wants to have a part of their church. He wants to be part of our church, okay? So here it is. They were lukewarm. They were self-sufficient. They were what you would call Christians that, maybe Christians in name only, in a sense. But to promise to overcome, you can set with Jesus. You can be in his inner circle. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? Peter, James, and John. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Remember the inner circle there, the closer ones? Even sometimes Andrew was part of that group, right? Uh, and seriously, could you imagine being part of that closeness with Christ in heaven? I, but it says here, you can set with Jesus, you can be in his inner circle. That's what it's talking about. If you realize you're dependent on him, you're willing to serve him, you don't have all your dependence on yourself, and so on and so on. I know when we started this church, Tippecanoe Bible Church, we started it on the premise of a clear gospel and preaching the Bible verse by verse. That doesn't mean we don't teach topical. We do teach topical. But even when we teach topical, we, we teach the verses that relate to that topical and we keep them in context. So here, we studied these three terms. Salvation, overcomer, inheritance. These are all serially connected to each other. First you get saved. 
um, and you 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 are. Uh, become an overcomer because you're saved, but then you can become an overcomer by dedicating your life and serving him. And so you have that inheritance in heaven, which is heaven, the new earth, but then you get a greater inheritance too by serving him and dedicating your life. So the problem is, what if you have salvation wrong? All the rest of this goes down the tubes, doesn't it? So let me give you a list of some of the incorrect teachings on salvation. And listen, I know some of you may not agree with these lists that I have, but they're true. I know they're true that these are incorrect teachings on salvation. Now, some are so-so, but hey, look at this. Don't you ever see about asking Jesus into your heart? Give your life to Christ. Turn from your sins. Be sorry for your sins. Confess your sins. Call on the Lord. Prove you are saved by your works slash fruit, right? These are all things that people say in most churches today. That little kid's kind of confused, okay? Aren't, wouldn't you be? You hear this all the time? What's wrong with asking Jesus in your heart? Well, nobody in the Bible doesn't say to ask Jesus in your heart. Emotion is not required. Understanding that Christ died on the cross for your sins, trusting Him by faith is. People tend to ask, tell children to do this, and our children really don't understand it. You know, you, a caught child can't understand faith in Christ saves them. And you explain it to them that they're a sinner, they need a Savior. Ask Jesus in your heart is kind of unclear. I'm not saying people don't get saved in that. If they're, what they're really doing is they're placing their faith in Christ. It's not a good way to do it. Give your life to Christ. Wait a second. Isn't that dedication or service or discipleship? No, he gave his life for you, didn't he? Didn't he give his life for you? Number three, make Jesus Lord of your life. That's called Lordship Salvation. That means I've got to do works to be saved. No, that's Lord of your life is discipleship. It's a lifelong process. Have any of you made Jesus Lord of your life yet? No. It's a process. We try, but we fail. We keep getting up. We keep going. So be careful because this stuff is taught in Christianity today. Turn from your sins. Be sorry for your sins. That's the false use of the word repentance, which repentance is an English word. If you look back at the Greek word, metanoia, it means change your mind. So whenever I use the word repentance in a message, I'm always going to say change your mind because people have been brainwashed everywhere. You first thing you hear is repentance. You think, turn from my sins. Be sorry for my sins. But that's not, how can you turn from your sins and be saved? Wouldn't that be good works? Right? None of us can turn from our sins. We're, we're dead in our sins, according to Ephesians. We can't stop sinning. Uh, be sorry for your sins. Now, the truth is, we admit we're a sinner. Now, when you get saved and you hear the gospel, you may show sorrow, right? There's nothing wrong with that at all. But it's not required for salvation. What's required for salvation? Admitting you're a sinner, you need a Savior, and you trust Him, right? So, Next one is confessed your sins. Which ones? Which sins? Do you know all your sins? What sin did you do two weeks ago? What sin did you do a year ago? How do you confess? You have to, every five seconds, confess my sin, confess my sin. No, that doesn't work that way. Once you're saved, you confess your sins. Just like your child, when they do something wrong, they get out of fellowship with you, and you may set them in the corner. Then they come to you and they say, Mommy, Daddy, I'm sorry, and give you a hug, and you forgive them, and you restore that fellowship, just like with God. We can drift away from that fellowship. Like Keith mentioned, that song that we sang, that second song we sang, you know, draw me close to you. And so confessing your sins is something after you're saved to remain that closeness to God, but it doesn't save you. And then call on the Lord. Now, many people use call on the Lord, and I know they get it from Romans 10, 13, but, you know, call on the Lord. If you're calling on him by faith, hey, Lord, I'm trusting you as my Savior, that's not bad. But truly what that verse means in Romans 10, 13 it comes from Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Remember this. I got this on your paper, the bottom part of your paper. Romans chapter 9, 10, 11 are what's called parenthetical. Okay? It was put in there. It's, Paul is going and talking to the Jewish people, and he's explaining to them this is what's going to happen during the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, they call on Jesus. He comes back and he saves them physically at the tri end of the tribulation. And so I'm not saying you can't get good things out of Romans 9, 10, 11 because God's principles don't change. Romans 11, 6 is just as true as for you as it is for them. It's, uh, I remember memorizing this verse when I went to Bible college. For my, well, I can't remember how to say it now, but um, if by grace it's not of works, otherwise grace is not of grace. But if it be of works, it's not of grace, otherwise works is not of works. It's basically saying grace and works are adamantly opposed. And that's true for you as a Christian just the same as it is for the Jewish Christians here in Romans 9, 10 through 11. So here's the thing. The last one, prove you are saved by your fruits or your works. Oh, this is so subtle to add works to it. This is called backloading the gospel. And here's the phrase they use. Works do not save you. 
But if you don't have works, you are not saved. Look in the mirror and say that to yourself and see how dumb that sounds. Works do not save you, but if you, are not, if you don't have works, you're not saved. Right? It's a sneaky way of adding works to salvation. Be careful about that. Yes, we should have works, but that's called obedience. That's called discipleship. It's called willingness to serve him. The salvation was offered as a free gift of salvation to you. So salvation is by faith. It really is, as you know. And the simplicity of this verse here, John 3.36, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. He that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You know what? If you don't trust Christ as Savior, your future home is hell. The wrath of God abides and stays on you. But if you trust him, you have everlasting life. What could be clearer than that verse, right? What does it mean? Think about that. That's so clear. It's so true. And if we believe on the Son as our Savior, we have everlasting life. And it sure makes this kid happy because now I get it. Just believe on Jesus. Isn't that simple? Is it for you and I? Aren't we kids sometimes and we don't understand things? But it's so simple. He loves us that much. He wants to save us. He wants us to live for him. And he promises that eternal life. But if you do serve him with everything you had, you get that additional rewards and inheritance. It's something to think about, isn't it? So let's think about this afternoon as we go home and throughout the week. Lord, what, is, what I'm doing going to please you that you're going to give me additional rewards and inheritance. It's, it's a wonderful thing when you think about it. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, your concern, and what you have did for each and every one of us by dying on that cross. And we thank you that you keep us saved. We thank you that it's unbelievable that you're going to offer us more than this by what's called inheritance or rewards in heaven because we've dedicated and lived for you well on this earth right now. We pray, Lord, that we truly, truly serve you and live for you right now. Lord, I pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.